Three mere mortals discover their ability to create entire universes with their minds alone. Upon discovering their abilities, these three, mm, gods if you will, join forces to create the Dark and Stormy Nights, a supercharged team of creatives with the aim of helping artists and writers around the world while combating the forces of boredom and mundanity. They are the Dark and Stormy Nights. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Dark and Stormy Nights. This is Loki. And this is Tyr. Uh, and this week, I am reading you my chapter, chapter six. We are calling it Chaos and Earthquakes. Cool. So, you want me to go ahead and just jump into it? We got anything to say? You got any announcements or anything? I don't think we have anything new going on. Don't forget to go to Nova Drake Writer on Twitter and buy Tyr's books. Mm. She she needs you to buy those. <laughs> so, <laughs> all right. We're going to get going, I guess. Sounds good. All right, so chapter six. The black Dodge Charger screeches to a halt in front of the emergency room doors of Metro Hospital. The big red glowing emergency room sign glowing menacingly overhead. I just noticed that poor piece of writing. Okay. <laughs> Lee gets out of the car and tilts the seat forward to let Elliot out. Elliot looks to Lee in hopes of finding emotional support, but Lee responds wearing a concerned look on his face. I'll be right up, kid. Go see your friend. Text me the room number. I have some pressing business to take care of real quick with our friend Rowan. Elliot's heart sinks to a place of disappointment. He solemnly nods and jogs through the sliding doors. Elliot pauses in the emergency room lobby shortly to get his bearings. He notices... A pattern and formulates a plan. Elliot walks over to the coffee machine and gets two coffees, hoping it will make him look like he has been there and is already with a patient. He waits a moment for someone to leave the patient area of the hospital so he could casually walk right through without needing to clear the front desk. He has been repeating the room number in his head since Bobby Ray from the Huntsman has, was kind enough to message him. Elliot became quickly turned around in the sprawling emergency room corridors. He thought a moment about asking a nurse for directions, but feared it would blow his cover, and he quickly lost his nerve. Elliot's anxiety reached a critical mass. His head was spinning. He started to hyperventilate. He became flush and hot. Sensing his distress, a nurse put her hand on his shoulder. Are you all right, sir? Are you lost? Uh, um, um, uh, is all he could mutter out. What room number are you looking for? 133, Elliot blurted out as fast as he could. Okay, it's going to be... All right, follow me. The nurse patiently guided Elliot to the room. A well-dressed, tall, black gentleman carrying a briefcase was exiting the room as he arrived. Here you go. See, that wasn't so bad. The nurse giggled, uh, lightening the mood. Elliot blushed in embarrassment and thanked her. Putting her hand on his arm, she said... You are very welcome, and gave Elliot a warm smile. Elliot turned back to the room. Pops was lying with the bed in an almost upright position. He had his glasses on, and he was reading some paperwork. Elliot quietly entered the room. Pops, looking up from his paperwork to see Elliot. Oh, my God, am I happy to see you, Pops rasps, rasped out. I was so afraid you were caught in that fire. What, what happened? Are you okay? Did you have a heart attack, Elliot? unleashed an inquisition of concern. I'm fine, I'm fine. It's just a spell of angina. In my rush, I forgot to grab my nitro, and the stress set me off. Oh my God, Pops, I'm so happy you're okay. But what are we going to do? I'm going to be honest, kid. I'm out. I can't do this anymore, and you missed the insurance guy by seconds. They had given me enough to retire on. It's warm beaches and margaritas in my future. Elliot's mind drifted. He knew he had nowhere to go and nothing left. Kid, Pops called to Elliot. Kid, are you okay? Yeah, Elliot squeaked out. Kid, there's a little money here for you to get started again also. I wouldn't leave you high and dry, but they said you might have to go and sign some paperwork for it or something. Oh, okay, Elliot replied. Smacking the door frame, Lee bid Elliot's attention. We gotta go, kid. It's an emergency. Sure thing, Lee. I'll be right there. 
And just like that, Lee was gone. Who was that? Pop asked, with all the concern of a doting parent. I'll introduce you later, Pops. I gotta go. Get some rest. We'll talk when I get back. Okay, kid. Be safe. Elliot spun about and jogged out the door and down the hall of the emergency room for the exit. Elliot passed an incoming ambulance crew hauling in what appeared to be accident victims. Once outside, Elliot scanned the area for Lee, who pulled up seconds later in a green Corvette. Where did you get this? Elliot inquired while seizing his composure. Ill- illegally parked in a handicapped zone. Heh, <laughs> Elliot chuckled. Well, I guess they had it coming. Lee pushed the accelerator to the floor, causing the tires to squeal. The Corvette reached unnerving speed by the time they reached the street. Lee drove hard and with blatant disregard for the laws and safety. Elliot gripped the seat like his life depended on it. The engine growled as Lee pushed it to the limit. The suspension hugged the road as Lee took corners without slowing down. The tires screamed as the hot rod went sideways to turn corners. Lee only took his foot off the gas long enough to make the turn, and then he was right back at giving it all he had. Lee cut their drive time in half by risking their lives, but he knew that they risked losing their bo- this bounty forever if they didn't catch it in time. And, oh yeah, a sorcerer's life was at risk. The song, Cruising for D- Disaster, suddenly overtook uh, the previously dormant radio. Elliot shut it off again. Honky Tonk wasn't his thing, and it was already hard enough to hold it together without the added noise. Lee saw the residents coming up on the right and decided not to slow down. He spun the wheel and pulled the emergency brake at the right time, causing the back end to kick out around. Then he dropped the brake and hit the gas. Elliot thought he was going to vomit as they flew through an unseen barrier that masked what was really happening at the beach home. The scene looked like an apocalypse in paradise. Elliot was pretty sure it was a completely different time of day inside this bubble. It was brighter, and at the very least, or it was brighter at the very least, but that could be from all the fire and lightning. Lee plowed the Corvette through one of the little zombies, sending parts flying everywhere. It took a moment for Elliot to process what he was seeing. A fiery giant flung little fireballs at the parts of zombies Lee just hit. Raina stood atop her charger, two shotguns blazing, blasting child after child. Rowan loaded guns and tossed them up to Raina, pausing only to kill anything that got too close. A group of fey zombies munched what Elliot guessed must have been a hunter at one time. A storm with a face raged over the lake, throwing bolts of lightning down at the zombies who latched onto hunters as a sort of kamikaze effort, taking hunters with them. Something dark stood in the surf, waving its arms around like a conductor, and the sand of the beach moved as though something large just below the surface was alive and angry. Lee hopped out of the demolished Corvette. Once the shock wore off, Elliot followed. Lee took his time, surveying the scenario. Elliot put put between himself and the children... Put Lee between himself and the children... Lee turned to Elliot. It's time, kid. I need you. I'm not shooting kids, Lee. They ain't kids, kid. They sure the fuck look like kids, Elliot chided at Lee. They are undead, kid. And before Lee could get out the words, the upper half of a zombie child gripped Elliot's leg and began to climb his body. Elliot flew into a tantrum, freaking out, trying to pry the half-child from himself. He avoided the child bites and swipes, as though his life depended on it, and it may have. He wasn't sure how any of this worked. As Elliot pulled one arm from him, the other always seemed to have reattached itself. Lee, though mildly concerned, saw this as as the opportunity it was. As Elliot took to begging for help, Lee simply handed him a gun, which in hindsight may not have been the greatest idea. Elliot immediately began firing at the zombie child before he had control of it. Stray bullets flew in every direction. Lee danced to avoid getting struck. One zipped past Reyna. The fire giant was struck and subsequently angered, and another hunter was struck in the leg, to which Lee simply shrugged his apology to. Elliot found a way to not only miss the child clinging to him with every single bullet fired, but also hit anything but a single other zombie child. 
Before any more damage could be done, Lee stuck the barrel of his oversized hand cannon in the child's gaping maw and pulled the trigger. A paste of rotting flesh and black ichor splattered on the ground. Elliot hopped about, completely skeeved out. I'm not sure if that's a very proper way to put that, but... (laughs) His anxiety had never been tested like this before, and he had enough. Lee waited a moment for Elliot to gain his composure. You cool? The fuck no, I'm not cool. (laughs) This is the furthest thing from cool, Elliot scolded. Get it together and start shooting these little bastards. I think the dark figure in the surf is controlling them, and I need to get to it. I need you to cover me as I make a run for it. I'm not, Elliot Elliot began, but Lee cut him off. Grow the fuck up. Do you want to die? No? Then do what the fuck I say. Shoot those little shits. I'll do the heavy lifting and this time try to hit one of them instead of anyone else. I didn't mean Lee cut him off again. It doesn't matter now. Uh, Oh, well, I guess I'm just going to go all the way through. (laughs) Uh, Lee tossed Elliot a couple more magazines of ammunition, took one more look around, and made a run for it. Before Lee could make it to the charger, the radio on the destroyed Corvette once again sprung to life and blared September. Lee dove uh, for the cover of the charger and Raina's hail of gunfire. Is that, she began to ask. Yep, earth, wind, and fire, he fi- Lee finishes. A propes. Lee attempts to assist Raina at first and looking up at her targets only to see she is shooting wild. Her, attempts looks cool, her attempt looks cool, but she is hitting nothing and the invasion of zombie children seem to be ignoring her altogether. The children seem to be targeting anyone but her and Rowan. There's no time to confront this at the moment. I need to get to the, th- the thing in the surf, Lee thinks to himself, as excuse me, he eyeballs his next destination. He finds a spot next to Jeb, a hunter he has only met a couple times. Jeb usually sticks to the rural areas, but Lee had to admit he admired Jeb's gun collection. Jeb was taking cover behind an overturned pickup truck, his blue jeans and flannel were stained with blood, hopefully not his. Jeb fired two Colt 45s like an old west gunslinger. He was turning the zombie into pace and between dodging fireballs and lightning bolts. Are you wounded, Lee shouted to Jeb. It's just a scratch, Jeb shouted back. The two hearted men, hardened men nodded at each other. As Lee took notice of a zombie creeping up on Jeb, which he quickly punted away, Lee tried to climb over the truck to reach to the gun ra- to reach the gun rack in the bed. He hoped to find something better suited for long-range combat. After struggling to get his old body up the chassis of the truck and onto the passenger side, which now faced skyward, Lee tried to unlatch the rifle without climbing off the truck. A blast whizzed past Lee's head as he tried. <clears throat> he first looked back at Elliot, whose focus was elsewhere. Must have been Raina, Lee thought. I'm going to kill that bitch when this is over. Lee thought to himself as he finally freed the latch. Lee lifted the rifle and leveled it at the creature in the surf. Every time he thought the shot was lined up, the creature in the sand kept blocking his shot. He knew he had to get closer. Lee hopped down off the truck, dodging a swipe from the fire giant, and then took cover behind <coughs> before it could launch a fireball at him. Lee looked back at Elliot, who now seemed to be holding his own. He had advanced and now stood near Rowan, who loaded weapons for Elliot as well now. It would be sad to take this relationship from him after this, but Lee was certain Rowan was up to no good, or at least Raina was and Rowan was accomplice. Lee turned his focus back to the thing in the surf. He used the scope to get a better look, but he wasn't sure he'd ever seen anything like this before. Its mouth was open as though it was frozen in terror. Its skin was dark as though desiccated. Its long bony fingers waved about, weaving some eldritch encampment. Whatever it was, Lee knew he needed to stop it at all costs. Fuck the sorcerers and the combine itself. This fucking thing was dangerous. Lee loaded his guns and charged. He sprinted down the steps of the beach, pausing to fire the rifle every time he saw he was about to have a clear shot. The thing seemed to see his next move. Lee knew if he kept firing, he might get lucky sooner or later. He finished descending the steps 
with volley after volley from the rifle until his boot hit the last step. Lee paused and pulled the trigger one last time as something took hold of his leg and sank sharp teeth in. The pain was like a hot knife. Lee dropped the rifle and, without looking, fired at the source of his pain with a single shot from his hand cannon. As much pain as Lee was in, he knew he had to keep going. Lee pulled a backup gun from his boot and fired round after round at the horror in the surf. Lee deftly dodged the beast under the sand as it charged him while nonchalantly reloading his guns. Lee was in the zone. His focus was on ending this creature once and for all and then collecting his reward. Lee could taste freedom as he sent round after round of hot metal sailing at his foe when suddenly the ground shook, liquefying the sand, causing Lee to sink knee-deep, becoming stuck. The sand creature had underestimated Lee's rage. Summoning a burst of adrenaline, Lee pulled himself free and continued his advance. Once again, Lee dodged the sand beast, and once again he returned his focus to killing the monster in the water. His gun screamed fury as he walked into the lake. Finally, Lee was sure he saw fear in the creature's eyes. Lee continued to fire at the monster, and the monster continued to dodge. The monster continued to back away until the two were chest deep in the water. And with a wave of the creature's hand and a grunt of some unknown language, the creature was gone in a flash of crimson light. Lee was furious. How the fuck do you kill this thing? Lee struck at the water in frustration as he marched ashore, his clothes now weighing on him. The water had soaked him to the bone, and exhaustion set in. Before, before Lee could exit the surf, he laid eyes on Reyna. I know that bitch knows something, he muttered out loud. Now that anyone, Not that anyone could hear him from here. Get down here, you bitch. I know you know something, he screamed. The yell sent him into a coughing fit. Reyna gestured back in confusion, but Lee couldn't stop coughing. Elliot became concerned. He checked around to be sure he was safe. Elliot noticed the phase zombie children were falling to the ground. They began to curl up into the fetal position and dry out as if they'd been mummified for some time. Once Elliot realized he was safe, he looked back at the beach. Lee was now down on all fours, hacking up a lung. Elliot went into a full sprint for Lee. Lee had fallen over on his side by the time Elliot reached him. He was still breathing, but his breaths were shallow. Elliot screamed for help. Jeb and Rowan answered the call, helping Elliot carry Lee back to the driveway. Jeb and Rowan put Lee in the back of the SUV that was owned by one of the hunters that had died that day. Elliot hopped in the front seat and started the truck. Don't fear the Reaper played. Jeb jumped in with him. Where do we take him? Elliot pleaded. I don't rightly know, Jeb answered. Rowan looked in the window. The bazaar, she said, with a somber tone of the moment. Lee knows the dragon lady who lives there. She can... Help him, but be careful. The bazaar is a dangerous place. I'll look out for him, Jeb piped in while tipping his hat. Elliot nodded to Rowan and peeled out of the driveway. Okay, cool. Do you want to take a break and then come back with, like... Yeah, sounds good. We'll come back with the critiques and all that jazz. Okay. Meanwhile, deep within the depths of Castle Numskull, our intrepid heroes explore the idea of being entertaining for once. Back to the action. Okay. All right, so you think maybe we need to tone down the finger pointing? Well, I just feel like we're only in Chapter 6. No. We wanted to raise suspicion, but I feel like it was a little bit heavy-handed. Um, now, towards the end there, after he gets bit, if you maybe had him start hallucinating a little bit then you could keep going with the Reina thing or maybe he starts seeing suspicion in other people as well and like that can throw off the the track a little bit but i feel like revealing it to the reader this early in the book Mm -hmm. is a bit too soon so maybe a little more what is she playing at than she's guilty um yeah we kind of just wanted to make him question things you know not necessarily like she's up to something because she is up to something. You know what I'm saying? So I don't know. That's my thought. Um, I do like Jeb. He's a fun character. 
So I'm kind of excited to see more of him and, you know, maybe touch on that a little bit in the next chapter. Well, he's going to help him through the bazaar, so, you know. Yeah. Yeah, no, he kind of had almost a, a, a Woody Harrelson and Zombieland kind of feel okay, to him. Okay, yeah. You know? <laughs> uh, uh, I can't remember the character I was going for, actually. There is this... Uh, Nice guy hillbilly in a movie I watched not that long ago. Yeah, I was ago. gonna say he's much nicer, more friendly, but <laughs> yeah. Uh, so. But with the guns and the truck and everything. Yeah. You know? Yeah, I feel bad for him losing his pickup truck, but right. yeah, now he's got an SUV. So. <laughs> um. So yeah, he's he's kind of a fun character and a fun addition there. Um. I like that he noticed that Reyna's shots were going wild. That's a good clue there. Um, did you mention anything about her standing on the car? Yeah, like yeah. I okay. said she's standing on the hood of the charger, which is he, he didn't point out. Maybe I can put that in there is that, mm -hmm. that maybe he's like, what? she would never do that. You know, right. she loves that thing. Right. Uh, so, yeah, just maybe note his surprise or something in that um, so that we so that the reader knows that it's out of character. Um, so, yeah, that's cool, and I like that he's noticing that her shots are going wide and that she's not doing anything. I think, honestly, if you want to keep the accusations towards the end of the chapter in there, I just think that you maybe need to have him hallucinating or seeing other things where he's suddenly, like, almost paranoid, you know? Like it okay, where maybe where it you starts with accusation and then descends into paranoia. Yeah, like but not necessarily just towards her. No, I know, but maybe it starts just towards her, right? So maybe it's, you know, that's where his rant starts. And then, you know. I assume it's this sand it creature that bites him that, that is causing his illness? Is no, it, it was one of the children under the, they were, one of the children were under the stairs he was. Oh, okay. Um, I thought there was some, I, th I missed that, I think. <laughs> but anyway. Uh, I don't think I said, because he you didn't did, look at it. You just said teeth sank into his. So I assumed there was something in the sand, because you mentioned the sand was stirring angrily. Yeah, it was just another, that was the earth elemental. Oh, okay, okay. So that was just me drawing lines that weren't there. Um, so that's cool. The He's actually been bit twice now. Lee has? Yeah, but I never said whether it broke his skin or anything the oh. first time. So we didn't really address it. Um, so that's cool. If you, Yeah, if he's been bit by the zombie at this point, and then I think that from that point on, you need to start making things weird. You know, like in that yeah, way, like, like clips and hallucinations, maybe. Yeah. Like or things start to happen. And then by the time he's wandering out of the water, like he's full on paranoia kind of shit, you know, and then you can leave like the the accusations towards Reyna and maybe throw in accusations towards other people. Uh, maybe even something throwing something Elliot's way. I don't know. Not necessarily Elliot, but maybe he feels like the whole freaking castle or mansion or whatever is out to get him at this point you know um and that way when he goes down you kind of are like what the fuck is going on you know and it's not just a straightforward well obviously Raina's behind this I don't, that's my thought if you have other no, ideas no no it's, i think it's pretty good actually uh so like i said i think what we'll do is he'll he'll start with accusations against Raina, which may be somewhat credible based off of the behavior, right? But then descend into paranoid yeah, rantings yeah. of anybody, you know? Right, right. You, you know, like maybe there's just a hunter who's like, "Dude, are you okay?" And he's like, "What did you have to do with this?" Or you know, something like that. So then he starts just accusing everybody, and they're all like, "What the fuck?" You know? And then he goes down, and it starts to become apparent that he's he's been affected by something. Yeah. Or maybe even if we have more than one hunter who's still alive that was bitten, maybe they all start going crazy paranoia, you know? Add a little bit of chaos into that end scene where Jeb and, and Elliot have to get Lee out of there while other hunters are kind of starting to lose it as well. Yeah. Yeah, it could be good. Mm -hmm. Now we've lost the children at this point, so... Right. So that's no more. But we had some other thoughts on, on where to go. Yeah. I'm wondering if... Well, eh. she was probably going to use magic. I was going to say, well, you know, maybe we take some of the children... Or something like that, along as anti venom or whatever, you know what I'm saying? But but she's mystical, so mm -hmm. does she really need anything like that? Mm -hmm. Do you do you think you're gonna need anything put in this to set up for your chapter? Well, my chapter is going to be taking him to the bazaar to be cured, right? Right, right. I'm saying, yeah, do you need do you have anything that needs to be put in here that No, I think you already up? did it with Rowan. Okay. 
Um, which is an interesting addition because we know that she has feelings for Elliot or she at least has kindness towards Elliot. Um, and whereas that's kind of going against Raina's master plan here. So that's maybe her first, maybe we want to lower her voice a little so she whispers it so that Raina can't overhear her. So yeah, we'll say she whispers in the window. Mm -hmm. So that'll kind of give the reader a clue that she's obviously keeping that from someone that she's helping, you know? When I say she looks in the window, we'll just change that one word to whispers. Whispers in the window to Elliot. Um, I had originally thought that I would take Elliot into the bazaar and maybe instead of making it to the dragon lady, he goes to the first person who offers to help him and gets himself in a bad situation. But if, if Rowan points it out that he needs to go to that lady specifically, then... I mean, they might get accosted going through the bazaar. Well, yeah, I'm sure they'll see fresh meat and go after him, but he's got Jeb to protect him from making a bad deal. But it could still be a good scene where somebody tries to, you know, like manipulate him or or stop him. I'm sure and they would. Jeb has to put a gun in their face or something. Right. Like that. We just have this theme, you know, throughout the story. It's a lot. There's a lot about debt and clearing the debt and having your own and like having to buy your freedom. Mm -hmm. um, and Lee has kind of been inundated, inundated by debt. And that's why he he works differently than the other hunters. He doesn't have the fancy gadgets and stuff. It's because everything is another debt. Right. You know, and that's kind of something that I was like thinking of, of continuing on with Elliot, where he goes in there and ends up in debt to save Lee. Right. You know, but if we're taking him back to the dragon lady, that's really not going to work. Well, it, he, it doesn't mean he doesn't owe her. You know <laughs> what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Just because they're familiar, just because they're friends, doesn't mean that there doesn't have to be payment for services, you know what I'm saying? So oh. you could, in the end, you know, the Dragon Lady could say, Lee can't take on this debt because he can't consent, but mm -hmm. you can. If you consent, you owe me a debt to save him. Can you tell me a little bit more about this character? The Dragon Lady? Yeah. Is well, she, like, it's modeled a after? Okay, I don't so know what that is. So uh, they're half serpent, half human. They tend to have a lot of sorcery. Mm -hmm. um, that's why she's called the Dragon Lady. I mean, she's like a, a snake, with the upper half of a woman. Right. Uh, however, beyond the curtains of her lair, she looks just like a woman. Inside right. I remember lair, that from your chapter. She looks... But, like, magically, <laughs> is there anything that she deal? Is there some sort of, you know, payment that is common to her? Or, or d I mean, is this, like, modeled after an existing creature? Like, mythology or, or yeah, something? Yeah, they don't... Well, I mean... It, it's a uh, I don't know if you, there's a there's a m show from when I was a kid called Taipan, mm -hmm. and there was a dragon lady in that l that looked like this, okay. and she was a sorceress. Um, okay. I don't know. I mean, I'm just imagining Asian magics or whatever, you know, because it's their it's one of uh, their mythologies. Okay. This creature. Okay, so. I'll look it up a little and see if I can't get so some ideas. On but uh, I mean, I think you probably go wild. She's an she's a middle you know Middle Eastern Asian sorceress. Mm -hmm. so. Okay. All right, that's cool. Um, so yeah, that was my only thing was just that it was a little heavy-handed with pointing out our our ultimate bad guy already. Mm -hmm. um, I liked the description of the boat axe, um, and then how it just kind of disappears at the right moment. Um, so we know that that's still something. Now has Lee identified the Bodak at this point, or you think he just saw that this is what's obviously orchestrating? Well, you know, it's something you can have in your chapter too, if you wanted to go back and forth between the mission to cure Lee and mm -hmm. his fever dreams that might give away what it is. So do you think he knows, or do you think he has to research this? I, I think that once he's awake in the bazaar, he's automatically going to have to go back looking for information on this new creature. I think that the fever dreams might give him an epiphany of what it is. The image of it might haunt his mind or something like that, you know? I was thinking he might have to go back to to the, the demon guy with information. Maybe, yeah. But yeah. then, you know, yeah, he's either going to have to have more blackmail on him or, mm -hmm. or a bribe or something. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, there's going to have to be some sort of dealing, or the fortune teller even. I don't know. There's a lot of places we could go with it. I guess we'll figure that out more in the next plotting episode. Yeah, yeah. we'll do that. But soon. yeah, I think that where you're you're leading up so far in this one is fine. We'll figure it out from there. Okay. Are we good today? 
Um, yeah, I didn't really have much else. Like I said, I liked the character. There's a lot of visual going on uh, in this one, you know, so. I was a little worried I might have been heavy-handed with description in some areas and not enough in others. I don't think that you were heavy-handed in the description. I think the only thing is that when we do our editing through is we'll want to intersperse the description with more action. Yeah. You know, or like. As opposed to just mentioning the si- shifting earth and the do- and the fireballs and stuff, you want to have them like stumbling mm. on the earth and dodging the yeah, fireballs, yeah. you know, that kind of thing. Like I said, I, well, I told you before the show, I wasn't like, I just I had a hard time writing this one, you right. know. And normally with action sequences, I don't have a l- mm-hmm. very hard time with them, but I just, it took everything I had to write this. Yeah, no, I feel you. Yeah, I've been struggling lately too. Um, so, but no, I think it was good. It's it, those are. Little things that you normally fix in editing, you know, just yeah. interspersing. Yeah, no, I knew, action. I know, I said, I did a lot of, of, you know, so and so did this, so and so did that, and it's mm-hmm. just like, you know, instead you would like show it better, you know. But right. I'm like, you know what, this is the the first draft, <laughs> so right, exactly. We'll get over it. So yeah, it's not a big deal. Like and those still, are it ended up being six and a third pages, you know. Right. It's yeah, it's not a big deal. Those are things that you normally fix in editing. So it is what it is. It's cool. Um, th- as long as you you know you've described the scene and we know what we're looking at when we go back, that's what matters. Yeah. Okay. So, any more announcements? Anything you got? Nope. Okay. I still have a free book on my website if anybody wants to sign up for my newsletter. Tell them what that website is. It is novadrake.vegvasiermedia.com. And um, and I have that. It's a a new series coming out in urban fantasy. Slash paranormal romance and and the prequel is up for free. Cool. And don't forget to go follow us at the Dark Stormy K One on Twitter. Uh, we also have a Reddit page, R slash Dark and Stormy Nights. Uh, that's nights with a K. So go check us out and uh, tell your friends. And we'll see you next week.